The mythical phenomena behind pre-Columbian American civilizations has always been shrouded in mystery. For ages, the world of academic science and history has fought tooth and nail to abolish the prior history of this illustrious continent. Most ignorantly entitled the new world this new world concept is a historical misnomer based upon the ignorant nature of European understanding of geography or quite possibly a purposefully deceptive name given to this land with the intention of manipulating the populace with a great lie. Any contradictory record of the Americas before the plague of Europeans threatens the entire foundation of classical academia. If they're wrong about the history of the Americas, that means they're pretty much wrong about everything else. Colleges, schools, universities, and governments would all be guilty of fraudulent propagation. Theories about our past would go up in smoke. And the people who had built entire institutions upon a mountain of lies would no longer be considered great. The greatest names in science and history would be labeled charlatans and the genetically modified tree of colonial Europe would be ripped from its roots. The roots of that tree are watered with the lies that ripped aboriginal people of the Americas from their identity. In 1828, the definition of an American was a copper-colored aboriginal who originally inhabited the Americas. Now, the word American implies European ancestry. In less than 200 years, the definition has completely changed. What was the reason for this change? The Euro heathen has quite the obsession with putting his name on things that do not belong to him. And his most effective methodology is paperwork and deceptive language. So even when the indigenous Americans learn that Caucasoid Europeans didn't discover their holy land, the heathen has already concocted a backdoor escape lie for the person who digs too deep. Beringia, they'll declare it. It was actually their Asian mongoloid cousins who made it to the Americas first. Here, look at these pictures, all photographed after 1828, mind you. These people are obviously of mongoloid ancestry. Just another example 
of the media using false propaganda since the days before the Civil War. But challenging this bearing straight theory will cause their entire historical timeline to fall apart. How sure are we that Mongoloid Asians were the first inhabitants of America? Harder questions have been asked by people who knew much less. Genetically, Caucasians and Mongols are the same people. A self-sustaining continental race of different hybrid species, as noted by most geneticists. But the environment in which they have spawned raises questions about the history of humans in general. Chronologically, the Mongoloid and the Caucasian are an incredibly young species of human, and any genetic indicators of their existence in archaic strata is only existent in the Neanderthal, a species of origin who traces back to the Caucasian wilderness of Eurasia. And this would leave us no better place to target a location for possible isolation. And ironically enough, history legitimizes this specific location as a place of interest. These stories, for one reason or another, have been suppressed from the narrative of world history. As most scientists have bought into, the human species migrated out of Africa, but a major hub of civilization is the notorious region between the Black and Caspian Seas. Is there any historical documentation of this region ever being isolated away from the outside world? The people of this ilk would undoubtedly fail to mention this history in their illustrious annals. Is there any trace of isolation? Any trace of segregation? Any trace of hybridization in the caucus? And what son of Noah? does this population represent? According to the histories of the Caucasus region, this area is known to be inhabited and populated by barbarians. These barbarians were apparently savages with extremely vile traditions and customs. It is recognized that in the antiquities and the histories of Alexander the Great that walls had been erected in entire regions of the Caucasus Valley between the Black and the Caspian Seas for the specific purpose of keeping out barbaric cannibals. 
The location of these walls is in present day Russia, Turkey, and Azerbaijan. Constructed in the pass of Derbent or the pass of Dariel, some scholars have even asserted that the Great Wall of China is in actuality a wall commissioned by Alexander the Great to keep out savage tribes from the north. The gates of Alexander are mentioned as well in the travels of Marco Polo in addition to the travels of Sir John Mandeville. Historians from antiquity were very matter-of-fact in labeling these people behind the wall descendants of Gog Magog. However, a few accounts by historians claimed that these barbarians trapped behind the wall were actually tribes of Israel. The Magogites that were north of the wall were the same hordes of barbarians that were used to sack media and aided the Romans. These people ethnologically were described as Scythians and sons of Japheth. So how could they be part of Shemitic bloodlines? This population who descends from the flesh-eating barbarian still holds tight to this claim. But these barbarian tribes over time would eventually overrun Asia, subsequently spreading throughout Europe. Their groups were divided into clans known today as the Saxons, the Visigoths, the Bulgars, the Slavs, the Franks, the Germans, and many more hybridized names for the same people. But what did these people who were blocked behind the wall look like? For centuries, European scholars have used words like barbaric and savage in their description of the darker races. But the heathens isolated behind the wall were never specifically described as Negroes. In fact, these clans from behind the wall are the bloodline progenitors of the pale race, identified throughout history with the Khazars, the Turks, the Tartars, the Mongols. These were the hordes spoken of in detail in the book of Ezekiel, identified by family name. Meshech and Tubal are mentioned as the principal families of Gog Magog. These families include the Scythians, the Celts, the Turks, the Germans, the Russians, all of Asia, and of course, the Ashkenazi. Is there further proof that the lineages of Meshech and Tubal are related to these modern populations? According to 15th century scholars, Meshech is the progenitor of the Russians. The Muscovites are said to have descended from this lineage, for which the city of Moscow is named. Tubal is said to be the progenitor to the Turks, the Italians, the Iberians, and the Basques. Quote, This Gog and Magog legend is not found in earlier versions of the Alexander Romance. In the latest and longest Greek version, are described as the unclean nations which include Goth and Magoth as their kings 
and whose people engage in the habit of eating worms, dogs, human cadavers, and fetuses. They are allied to the Belarusians and are sealed beyond the breasts of the north, a pair of mountains 50 days march toward the north. Quote from the travels of Sir John Mandeville. In the end, Mandeville predicts a lowly fox will bring the chaos of invading monsters upon the heads of the Christians. He claims without revealing how he comes by such specific prophecy that during the time of the Antichrist, a fox will dig a hole through Alexander's gates and emerge inside the monster zone. The monsters will be amazed to see the fox, as such creatures do not live there locally, and they will follow it until it reveals a narrow passageway between the gates. The cursed sons of Cain will finally burst forth from the gates and the realm of the reprobate will be emptied into the apocalyptic world. Quote from the Jews of Khazaria by Alan Brook. Quote, as one nomadic people followed another on the Eurasian steppes, so the identification of Gog Magog shifted. In the 9th and 10th centuries, these kingdoms were identified with some of the lands of the Khazars, a Turkic people who had converted to Judaism and whose empire dominated Central Asia. After the Khazars became Mongols, seen as mysterious and invincible horde from the east who destroyed Muslim empires and kingdoms in the early 13th century, kings and popes took them for the legendary Prester John marching to save the Christians from the Saracens. But when they entered Poland and Hungary and annihilated Christian armies, a terrified Europe concluded that they are Magogali, the offspring of Gog Magog. Released from the prison Alexander had constructed for them in heralding Armageddon. End quote. Although Madai isn't mentioned by name as much as hidden, it is important to follow his lineage. The Book of Jubilees chapter 10 offers contextual insight into the relationships between the nations of Japheth and Shem. The Book of Jubilees itself is considered apocryphal because it was literally burned and hidden from the public until older copies started showing up and was not considered canonized scripture by the Catholic Church. However, it is considered canonical by Ethiopian Jews and the Ethiopian Orthodox Church. The Book of Jubilees gives us more insight into Genesis 9.27 God shall enlarge Japheth, and he shall dwell in the tents of Shem, and Canaan shall be his servant. At the end of chapter 10, it states, And Japheth 
And his sons went toward the sea and dwelt in the land of their portion. And Madai saw the land of the sea, and it did not please him. And he begged a portion from Elam and Ashur and Arkpashad, his wife's brother. And he dwelt in the land of Media, near to his wife's brother, until this day. And he called his dwelling place and the dwelling place of his sons Media after the name of their father, Madai. It appears that the quote, Jepheth will dwell in the tents of Shem, is more specifically referring to the sons of Madai, who begged Shem for a portion, more specifically, Ashur, Elam, and Arpachshad, his wife's brother. Furthermore, it states that the sons of Madai dwell in the land of Shem until this day. Meaning Madai who settled in the lands of Shem shares features across the board with the sons of Japheth who include populations in both Asia and Europe and this family relationship is never more apparent than in the Semi people of Northern Europe. These are some of the oldest populations of Finnish and Scandinavian people left in existence. And it is obvious to see the features from both populations are distinct in the traits of these people. The highly recessive blue colored eyes are a predominant feature among these people commonly shared with Europeans. Yet, they have the flattened face and the slanted eyes of a stone-cold mongoloid. These are some of Europe's oldest Koko Mongo people. Yet and still, these people aren't black. The first inhabitants of Southern Europe Northern Africa, Arabia, France, and the British Islands were a race of small men who did not average in height more than about four feet, five inches. They were of slight build with dark complexion. They were cave dwellers, emanations from Lemuria. They first buried their dead in caves, and when the caves were not available, they placed their dead in long barrows or graves in a row. Some such barrows were 400 feet long and 50 feet wide. They were an African people. And there appears to be evidence that they sometimes practiced cannibalism. It is said that the first people in Ireland were the formations. They were a dark, stunted race, utterly savage, using rough, unwrought stone implements. So far as can be learned, they did not know the use of fire. It is said they came from Africa on ships. Several anthropologists in the early 1800s were in agreement that the first inhabitants of the British Isles were a race of black people, pygmy and stock. These people were renowned as being very small but ferocious fighters and hunters but lacked the intelligence to civilize. Europe at one point had a thriving black population that was the envy of the Gentile nations. But what happened to these people? If Meshech and Tubal were sons of Japheth, and many historians associate Meshech with Russia, were there ever any black Russians? Indeed there were. 
Undoubtedly, the entirety of civilized Europe was under the control of an elite Negro ruling class. This lasted, by most accounts, up until the Moors were expelled from Spain and through the following centuries of colonization. Blacks were killed off and bred out of the aristocracy. Essentially, this European model was the precursor to the invasion of the Americas. Even European history has been scrapped and repackaged by the pale invaders. The barbarian invasions initiated the fall of Rome and the transition into the Dark Ages. This area could further be characterized as the time span of the subsequent invasions in which all tribes seem to be invading from the north and the region of the Caucasus. These barbarian migrations coincide with the spread of Christianity, Catholicism, and later Islam. Yet, in complete contrast to Gog and Magog are symbols of British ancestry. How could this be? If the first inhabitants of the British Isles were black pygmies, who resembled the populations in South Africa, an area later colonized by the Brits. Why are Gog and Magog held in Britain with such giant esteem? According to British legend, Gog and Magog were giants who are now heralded as the heroes of the Brits. Large statues dedicated to these giants stand as iconic figures in the halls of London, commemorated as the guardians of the city. Gog and Magog are celebrated in British festivals with gigantic floats being paraded through the streets of London. From around 400 AD until 1491, during the period history considers the Dark Ages, the power within Europe transitioned from black to white. The lineages of the royal bloodlines were snuffed out. Just as in the Americas, the ruling classes changed hands and the foreign invaders from the cold regions of depravity ransacked the lands and the people of abundance and the world was forever changed. Most geneticists, whether they recognize it or not, are in total agreement with the Bible as it concerns the lineage of Japheth. Caucasians and Mongols are related by virtue of the Japheth bloodline connection. We can see a clear ancestral relationship between Caucasians and Mongoloids in which the world of genetics uses as the theme song for the We All Are The Same campaign. Much literature has been repackaged throughout the ages in Europe and Asia, therefore leading to a deceptive historical narrative. Indeed, many writings and works of art from classical Roman antiquity had been recreated under the charlatans of the Renaissance. The oldest religious icons of Christianity in Roman ages of Europe were indeed black. 
from the depiction of angels, wise men, the Virgin Mary, to images of Christ. Negroes were the dominant characters in Christian iconography. Yet it would be the pale Christians who would eventually conquer and rule Europe. And soon after, the artistry of the Renaissance depicted historical imagery far different than the true account of the past. This process of dissemination and whitewashing ran its course over the span of a thousand years or more. The fabricators of history have deceitfully interbred millennia of other cultures' advancements into their own narcissistic history. If genetically these people aren't necessarily the same, what distinguishing qualities would make them family? If the Scythians, Celts, and Germans alike are all sons of Japheth, more specifically Gog Magog, and today we do not recognize those nations as black, does that mean they used to be black? The name Gog Magog is synonymous with pale red-haired giants from the questionable writings of Josephus to the emergence of Albion, Hibernia, and eventually Britannia, the face of Gog is a stark contrast to the pygmy African Negroes later discovered by anthropologists. Is it possible that a race of giant barbarians colonized the British Isles and murdered all of the native inhabitants? Could these pygmies be related to the same pygmies recorded by Mercator in his map of the hidden continents around the North Pole? These are complicated questions and many answers are uncertain, but one fact is most certain. The location of these events are on the Isles of the Gentiles. Even if the ruling classes of Britain, Rome, Germany, and Russia were all black, they still were all Gentiles living amongst heathens and cannibals. So the black rulers were either blood descendants of hybrid albino cannibal giants and the Caucasoid takeover of Europe could have in fact been a weird Caucasian family reunion complete with incest and murder activities quite familiar to the Japhethite or these European Negroes migrated from Africa or possibly the Americas, then that would mean they broke the oath sanctified between their forefathers and Noah and are thereby cursed, thus deserving everything they got.
In the case of Madai, however, he pleaded for a portion of Shem's land where he dwells until this day. It seems as though Eber, Ashur, or Arpachshad acquiesced to this request made by Madai. At this point, it is unclear that by living in the tents of Shem, if any part of the curse is attached to this portion of Japheth. This example may be indicative of some variety of special treaty enacted on behalf of the parties included. Could lands be redistributed or gifted without breaking the oath? Furthermore, expounding upon the relationship, Madai, a son of Japheth, had taken a wife who was Arpachshad's sister. Arpachshad was a son of Shem. These two lineages have been living together nearly since the days of Babel. Maybe this is the Japhethic claim to those being the tribes of Israel. Intermarriage. From the days before Israel had an established independent kingdom, the sons of Madai have dwelt in the tents of Shem. Could this relationship between Madai and the sons of Shem explain the Mongoloid presence in pre-Columbian America? Or were the sons of Madai Negroes at the time? There are obviously genetic parallels between the Mongoloid types in ancient America and the continent of Asia. But what about the differences between them? These questions and more on the next episode of The Smartest Beast in the Field.